Okay, I'm Alexander Motil. I'm a professor at Rutgers University on the Newark campus. And I'm here to talk about my 10th novel called Pitoon's Last Stand, an entertainment about the fall of Russia. I mean, the term entertainment, I, I stole that from Graham Greene. Um, you, you, you may be aware that, you know, in addition to his very serious novels dealing with very serious topics, he also wrote a number of novels which were a little more lighthearted. And he al always referred to them as entertainments. So, again, this is my homage to him. As a matter of fact, the book is dedicated partly to him as well as to another author, Eric Ambler, um, who also wrote these kinds of novels. Um, but so that's the origins of the term. As to what's entertaining about the fall of Russia, well, <laughs> um, I think the answer for many Ukrainians and non-Russians is kind of self-explanatory. Um, you know, many, many of us or many of them um, think of the possibility of the fall of Russia as a good thing. Uh, so in a way, what the novel does is imagine what that might be like um, and what the consequences of that might be. The book is, a, it's a novel, as I said, and it's, it's a relatively straightforward plot. Most of the action takes place on a train. Uh, again, it's a device used by Graham Greene, Eric Ambler, and many other authors as well. Uh, but the hero of the story, or the two heroes of the story, one is an American journalist and one is a British journalist. He is a, he, the American is a man, Stephen, and the Brit is a woman. So that, of course, makes it possible for there to be a romantic angle. And I won't tell you if there is, but that's at least the possibility exists. Anyway. He's assigned, he's a journalist in New York City, and he's assigned to travel to Moscow to cover a conference of some kind. In the interim, uh, Mr. Petun, uh, the president of Russia, decides to invade Estonia. And instead of traveling to Moscow, the journalist, Stephen Smith, travels to Tallinn. Much to his surprise, everything is peaceful. Because in the interim, in the immediate aftermath of Petun's invasion of Estonia, terrorism, assassinations, wars, and all sorts of other things have broken out within Russia, with non-Russians attacking the Russians, the Kazakhs and the Ukrainians launch armed invasions. I mean, all sorts of stuff happens in the interim. And he realizes that the real story is in Moscow. So the action shifts to Moscow where he is witness to major terrorist attacks and explosions on Red Square. So St. Basil's Cathedral is destroyed, Lenin's Mausoleum is destroyed, the Goom department store, the building is destroyed, and he witnesses mayhem, havoc, bloodshed, destruction. And he's got enough, and he returns to Estonia, to Tallinn, um, and he decides that he needs a break from the bloodsheds and that he'll go to Nice, the Riviera, for a few days of R&R before returning. He's joined on this trip by the British journalist, whom he knows from his journalistic exploits. Um, they arrive in Nice. They're not lovers. They're not boyfriend or girlfriend. They're just colleagues. They arrive in Nice, and on their first day, they go to a casino, um, and, in, and they see a man who looks suspiciously like Petun, who in the meantime has fled Russia together with his henchmen, and no one knows where his whereabouts are. They do some additional digging, and it turns out that this lookalike is indeed the Russian dictator who is plotting his return, his revanche, together with some sleazy Frenchmen and some Germans and some Russian emigres and so on. They manage to get an interview with Petun and in a moment of, sort of at one moment, the journalist, the American journalist suggests, well, if you're going to go to Russia, if you're planning a return, you should do what Lenin did in 1917 and take a train from Zurich to St. Petersburg. Petun thinks this is a fabulous idea 
and he asked the two journalists to join him and be the chroniclers of his triumphant return. And the majority of the book then takes place on the train. There are the number of stops, there are all sorts of people, adventures, misadventures, presumably some, I hope, what, what people consider to be some humorous moments. Um, and then they meet a whole bunch of characters, and then the novel actually ends at the train station in St. Petersburg. I won't tell you how it ends, of course. I, I can't do that. <laughs> that would be violating all sorts of privileges. But that's basically the novel in a nutshell. You, you know, there are all sorts of ways in which one comes upon a topic. Some of them are purely accidental. Um, and um, I mean, I'll give you one example of the accidental as briefly as I can. Um, a number of years ago, before I wrote The Jew Who Was Ukrainian, um, I was reading a, a novel by an Austrian writer, Stefan Zweig, in which he kept on using the word Frauenzimmer, which is a kind of somewhat antiquated German ver word for woman, for Frau. And I just, for some reason, that word struck me as being hilarious. Uh, literally, it means women's room. So it you know, doesn't even make any sense. But in any case, it struck me as being hilarious. And I began rhyming Frauenzimmer with Volodymyr. For, again, I can't explain why. And as I kept on rhyming it, and again, it was just stuck in my head, I realized I've got a, I've got a hero of an absurd story, Volodymyr Frauenzimmer. Um, and as it turned out, you know, his father is a Ukrainian, his mother is Jewish or something to that effect. And there you go. And I had a novel. Right. But again, it happened quite by accident. I mean, I have no way of explaining why that happened. Most of the work I've done has tended to be inspired by stuff I've done in the immediate uh, past. Uh, so I did a novel on Andy Warhol, which was inspired by my research on Andy Warhol. I did a novel on the Holodomor, which was inspired by my research on the Holodomor. Uh, which eventually came out as a book with Bohdan Klid. I did a novel on Mazeppa, which is unpublished, which was inspired by some of my research on Byron's poem and its after effects in Europe and the United States. I've had a, as to this particular novel, I mean, there are two explanations. One is that when I wrote this last summer and then I kind of let it lie and I went back to it a few months ago. Well, last summer, as you recall, there was the constitutional crisis, there were some mass marches, and for the first time in many years in the West, as well as in Russia, people were writing about the possibility of Putin's departure. Now, I've been saying this for 20 years, so again, I've been predicting his end for 20 years, uh, and you can interpret that any way you like. But in any case, so this was music to my ears, and I suspect that, you know, pandemic is all around, you're confined to home, and then suddenly Putin is in the news, and I decided to do this particular story. Imagining one of the scenarios that people do write about. I mean, Estonians are genuinely afraid of being invaded, as are Latvians and as are Lithuanians. So, you know, this isn't exactly science fiction, it's actually based in reality. And then the second reason for this emphasis on Mr. Petun, uh, as I said, I've had a kind of academic obsession with the man since 1998. I've thought of him as being a disaster for Russia, as well as Ukraine, as well as everybody else since then. Um, and I've imagined scenarios of his downfall, I mean, for 20 years, and I've written about this in you know, serious academic formats as well. But in addition to that, that particular obsession with Putin, with Putin, has translated, has also has translated into and affected my our creative work. So I've done four large paintings satirizing Putin. They've all been sold. One of uh, right, one in Poland, one in Maryland, one in Ohio, and I believe one in Pennsylvania. And this was done over the last 20 years. And you can find them on Facebook. Um, but in addition to that, this is actually the third of my Pitoon satires, because the first one that satirized him was the Jew who was Ukrainian, uh, where he fig where Pitoon figured as a kind of minor character in the background, 
but he was there. The novel was effectively about him, even though he was in the background. Then the second novel that I did explicitly on him was called Vovochka. That was that appeared about seven, eight years ago, and that was supposedly uh, Petun's best, the, the memoirs and diary of Petun's best friend and confidant. And so this is the third. Um, so, you know, and, you know, much to my surprise, when the book came out, I realized, my gosh, I have a trilogy. <laughs> I have a trilogy dedicated to this odious individual in the Kremlin, Vladimir Vladimirovich Pitun. Any any semblances between him and anybody else are, of course, purely accidental. You, you know, as one of the as one of the characters in the Jew who was Ukrainian says about Mr. Petun is that Petun rhymes with spittoon. But this is one of the nice things about novels is that you can imagine things and say things that you would be hard pressed to say in an academic publication. <laughs> there are academics who write novels. I mean, the British have a long tradition of academics writing spy novels. Um, and there are some academics in the US who've written novels. Uh, generally, though, it's 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 a rarity. I mean, at least in this country, I'm, I I won't speak for Britain, uh, but generally speaking, people stick to their genres and their specializations um, for obvious reasons. That's what you do, and that's what you do relatively well, or perhaps well. So why try something that might get you into trouble? Um, you know, in my case, um, I started writing novels about 15 years ago. Uh, yeah, it's roughly 15 years ago. I think the first one came out in 2007. Um, and to me, it was very much just an, all, an alternative to academic stuff. You know, the the problem with academic writing is that it tends to follow a certain format for understandable reasons. Again, because you're trying to be serious and you're trying to be more or less scientific and there are things that you need to do and things that you need to say and there are things that you may not do and may not say um, and you know you pretty much know what you're going to conclude when you start writing an article or a book that's the whole point right i mean you already have something ready made and the beauty of novels or the beauty of literature in general amongst many beauties of course but one the one that always has always enthralled me is the fact that I don't know what the end will be. And even when I know what the end will be, I don't know. It, it often changes. I don't know what the middle is. Um, you know, authors always say or often say that in a dialogue or in a conversation, the characters come alive and they seize control of the conversation and take it into directions that you didn't want it to go. That is absolutely the case. Not only that, the circumstances of the novel, they, you know, you may have intended uh, this set of circumstances, A, to lead to B, but in the way that you painted circumstances at, time, at this time, it, they lead more logically to C or D. And suddenly you're off on a tangent and you don't know how you got there. <laughs> and then you face the dilemma, do I retrace my steps and go back? Or do I just go on and see where it takes me? What a novel can do when it, I mean, when you translate what you've learned to the academic sphere, is it teaches you a certain degree of modesty and humility. Uh, because you begin to appreciate that, again, in a novel, you appreciate that you can actually spin just about any story. And if you write it well enough, and if you, you, you know, if you use, if your characters are, are, are vigorous enough, and if the plot is persuasive enough, it can ring true. As a matter of fact, novels often, often ring truer than nonfiction, right? I mean, whom would you read to find out, you know, what war was like? 
uh, the historian or the novelist, probably the novelist. I mean, if you want to get a sense for what trench warfare was like, if you want to get a sense of what the whole de model was like, you know, uh, novels and eyewitness accounts are better than reading academic texts, which just go into numbers and things of that sort. So it teaches you a certain humility. And you begin to realize that since in the arts so many things are possible, um, you begin to realize that in the claims you make as an academic, perhaps you should be a little more restrained. Uh, perhaps everything you say isn't necessarily the ultimate truth. That's not to say that it is all relative and that truth is impossible. I'm not arguing that at all. I'm not trying to suggest that history and political science or anthropology are like novels or like poetry, um, but they do have some similarities and they lead one, I lead me to the conclusion that we shouldn't be too arrogant. We need to be a little more humble in the kinds of claims we make. But in terms of the novel itself, I think people will find it, um, I mean, parts of it are somewhat terrifying. Um, it's Parts of it are very sad, parts of it are very tragic, um, um, parts of it are funny, parts of it are humorous, um, and um, I'm hoping that people who read it will indeed be entertained. That's the intent. Mm -hmm.